All right, last time we were talking about the new era, this new section of the Old Testament, trying to still find how things are paced and what God's doing and what his purpose is. And God is bringing in a king, and through that king, he's bringing in a temple. And I said that both of those were very important. We're going to look a little bit at the king, and then I want to spend the majority of the time today looking at the temple. Because I think we spend, and the next time we're going to really get into the king part, because that's, that's the fun part. But this one I think was interesting. Uh, that we find what the temple was, what was its purpose, what went on inside, what did not go on inside, and, and look at it going forward from there. So, but first we want to look at, we saw Saul. Saul has been tossed off on the side. He's still king though, will be king for several years after this. But we are in Samuel chapter 16. So if you would turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll begin. Uh, that would be 443 in the black books. If you remember in chapter 15, God told Saul because of his disobedience, because he was going to offer sacrifice, do what he wants to do the way he wants to do it, uh, not the way God commanded, that his kingdom would be remo was removed, that God rejected him. So he did. And that was in 15. Then in 16, we have Samuel being told by the Lord, go to the house of Jesse. I'm going to go and I want you to go anoint the new king. Mind you, Saul is still king. Okay, he hasn't been dethroned yet. So, we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting in verse 11. Starting in verse 11. So that's on page 444, sorry. Samuel has gone to, to Jesse, all the older sons have gone by. They've proce uh, proceeded, paraded through, and they look pretty awesome. You know, they, there's one, oh, that one obviously is the king. He's he's big, musk guy, whatever. And God says, no, that's not who I've picked. Not him, not him. Until all of the child, all of the sons are gone. Until you get to verse 11. So he, Samuel, asked Jesse... Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He, meaning David, was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Pretty earth-shaking, huh? dun da da, da New king. What does he do for the first, what, 12, 13 some odd years of his life after this point? Run from Saul. Yeah, run from Saul. Saul's going to kill him. Saul, he's in caves. He's running around. He even goes to the Philistine camp after killing Goliath and pretends to be a crazy man to run from Saul. And so, he, I mean, David's all over the place. He's not king, only anointed. He doesn't become king until first or second Samuel. So let's flip over to second Samuel. And let's take a look at this king. Saul dies at the end. He's killed at the end of 1 Samuel. 2 Samuel, page 480 in the black books. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Um, David has pretty much established the land. He has established pretty much his throne. There's there is a little bit of rest for him. And I would just like to read some of this and see what you think of it. And we're going to look at it. I want you to hear some of the language that's being used. See if it sounds like anything you've heard before. Okay? So starting in verse 1. 
after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. So what is, what is David considering? Building the temple. Building a temple. The temple so far is non-existent. There is no temple. There is no permanent place. It's still the tent, the tabernacle. And the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence is in the tabernacle. Remember we talked about that, that moving throughout history. We're moving from tabernacle to the temple. And then later on we'll move into the church. Remember that, that progression? Well, right now the, the Ark... The presence of God is still in a tent. And so David feels that's not cool. We need to, you know, I'm in this big palace. We should build something. So Nathan, the prophet says, go ahead. God's with you. It's all good. Go ahead. But in verse 4, there's a change of plan. That night the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in the house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers, whom I commanded to shepherd the people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? What's God's response? At that point. Don't be so presumptuous. Yeah, don't be so presumptuous. And all the time that I've been traveling in this here tent, since coming out of Egypt, have I ever asked or commanded any of the people, any of the leaders of Israel, to build me an, a temple? To build me a house? Well, what's the answer to that? It's a rhetorical question. No, he's never asked. Okay, let's keep going. But it seemed to have pleased God for some reason. So let's go into verse 8. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I, count the eyes, I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be dis uh, disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. Let's stop there for a moment. What does that sound like? Does that sound familiar? Sort of like promise made Joshua? No? Joshua, no. Close. That that's true. So. F flip back just a little bit. Go all the way back to Genesis 12. Remember, all of this started with Abraham. His name was Abram. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. It's on page 17. You got it? Everybody there? Look in verse 2. Or actually, let's go back up to verse 1. Chapter 12 of Genesis, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. 1. I will make you into a great nation. And 2. I will bless you. 3. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Sound familiar? How about 15? Uh, 
chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 5. He's reaffirming His covenant. He says, He took him outside. He took Abram outside. And said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. They, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. What is that part about? What's the offspring about? Do you remember our, our study on that? One person. It's one person. It's, it literally is seed, singular. Paul says, he didn't call it seeds, will inherit. Our seeds will be as many. He said seed. Singular, capital S. Uh, you're going to have to clarify that because I, I see, look up at the heavens and count the stars. There are numbers. Uh, yes. Although we can't count them. Um, so shall your offspring be as many as there are stars. Yes. So would you please clarify what Through the one offspring. Through the one. Through the one offspring, Paul says, have come many descendants, many offspring. Christ was the first of many. Yes. Does that make sense? So those, those verses starting to resonate a little bit? That's what he's talking about. So he, he's promised those things. And if you go back to... 2 Samuel 7, starting in verse 9, I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great. What does that sound like? Isn't that, what one, of the, isn't that one of the things? I will make your name great. Great. What else does he say? I will provide a place for Israel. I will provide a place for Israel. What, what was that part in the Abraham covenant? Did he not say, look, at, go, look as far north, as far south, as far east, as far west. I give all of this land to you. Did he say that? Wasn't part of it? So, I will give you a place, land. Oops. What else? Is that hard to see? Let me turn it to black. I'll go to black. What else? Appointed leaders, he's given him a leader. What about the last part of that section? How about I will give you rest from all your enemies? Mm -hmm. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore. So he'll give them peace. Then peace from their enemies. Okay? Keep going. There's more. God's not finished. In the middle of verse... Uh, la, 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 verse in the middle of verse 11, it says, The Lord declares... You see that? On page 481. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you where your days or when your days are over and you rest with your fathers I will raise up your offspring hmm, to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom he is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But, but my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, the part I want you to focus on 
is this middle part. After David dies, God says, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Who is that? Jesus. Could be. It's a duel. There's two. He's speaking of Solomon and Christ. Some of it Solomon fulfilled, but Solomon is a human and will die. He cannot have a kingdom forever and ever and ever. However, Solomon's the one that built the temple. Now, this is where I want you to start looking at this relationship between king and temple because it's important. This is the one that ties Solomon to the physical temple and Christ to the eternal temple. Yes. Who is the eternal temple? The church. The church. Those who are saved. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Spirit of God? Right? Keep going. Uh, come on, come on. Don't go ahead. <laughs> so you have Solomon in this passage, who is the direct offspring of David, who will have a kingdom that if he follows, and we're going to find out, God is going to tell Solomon, if you follow, I'll be with you. If you don't follow, there will be consequences. And this has been the problem. You've ha Every single king that comes along is human and fails. He cannot be the mediator of God's covenant. God is mediating the covenant, his blessing, to the people of Israel through the king. The king messes up, the people suffer. The king does well, the people have prosperity and peace. So they need, in order for God to actually bring his covenant of blessing to the people, he needs a king that's not going to be fallible, that's not going to mess up. Saul messed up. David did well for a while, but even David messed up. Man after God's own heart. Yes, exactly. Look at all the psalms that that man wrote amazing beautiful beautiful psalms we always turn to the psalms when we need that 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 healing that that re that feeling of okay I, I can make it through David wrote many of those and the men he appointed wrote many of those so but he failed Solomon wisest man to ever live failed so God needs a king to mediate, to be the mediator between himself and his desire to bless, his desire to love, and the people. So who does he get? Who does he ask? His son. And he says, son, I need a king who will not falter. I need a king who will never be unfaithful to me. I need a king who will, who will be Put me first, a king who will serve me, a king who is after my, no, my own heart. Okay. All those things. Obey. Yes, listen to me. Follow me. Do my will. That's what I need. I need a king. And he will do that. Now, Solomon, David says, I want to build you a temple. God says, no. I will build, I will, I will bring about I'll build your house and out of your offspring will come one and he will build my house for me. Notice that it says the offspring will build a house. Again, Solomon physically, literally built a temple for the Lord. A house of God is what it's called. A house of the living God. He built that. Didn't last very long, because in about 586, somewhere around there, it was completely destroyed. Just wiped out. No stone. I mean, they, they took, the, what they did in that temple and what they did in that temple was just horrendous. Nebuchadnezzar went in, grabbed all the gold, all the things, took them off to Babylon, and put them in the temple in Babylon. Completely destroyed. Later it was rebuilt, but it wasn't anywhere near what Solomon did. 
Solomon's temple, you could see shining from miles away because it was made of gold. 45 feet tall, 70 some odd feet long, 30 some odd feet wide, something like that. Big, huge bronze pillars in the front, two big bronze pillars. The inside was inlaid with gold, the floor, the sides, the roof. Cherubim, 15 feet tall, overlaid with gold, with wingspans 15 feet apart, or 15 feet wide, lined to the front of the Holy of Holies. I mean, this place was awesome. Seventh, eighth, ninth wonder of the world, whatever you want to call it. People would come from all over the place. And the Bible talks about the light on the hill. That was not a, a lighthouse. That was the temple on top of Mount Zion. And you could see it. It was imposing, is what the Bible says. It was incredible, incredible. So that's what God says. And if you notice, many of the things that God tells David and makes a covenant with David, he has already made with Abraham. It started with Abraham. It moved into the... The Mosaic Covenant it now moves into the Davidic Covenant, David's Covenant, and it's going to continue. But it's getting closer and closer and closer to the perfect covenant between Christ and the church. It's all moving in that direction. So, with that, we're going to look back again later at the idea of king. But I want to take a moment and look at this idea of temple. Temple. <laughs> temple of the living God. And the first one thing I want to look at is the picture of the temple. In the temple. Can you see the green? It's better than the other, but better than the first one. I want to look at in the temple. Then I want to look at the cow. I want to look at the practical aspects. Practical means now. What does it have to do with us? And then the last one I want to look at is church versus the temple. <coughs> Whatever. Okay. This one I have outlined. This one I have outlined. This one you will do. We will do this one collectively together. Okay? Yeah, that, that me, yeah, you too, Phyllis. Don't fall asleep, Nikki. Hang in there. Okay, what is the purpose of the church? What is this in the church? Or, excuse me, temple, sorry. My bad. What is the purpose of the temple? Now we're gonna flip over to Second Chronicles. We're gonna we're gonna bounce around a little bit. So go to Second Chronicles for a moment in chapter seven. Second, it's on page 684. <laughs> you want page numbers? <laughs> All right. So, purpose. What is the purpose of the temple? What was its... Why would, why, why would anybody create the temple? God was dwelling in the tent. So when, it, when they moved the Ark of the Covenant to the temple, what did it do to the temple? So here we go. Second Chronicles, chapter 7. Would someone please read verses 1 through 3 from this table over here? When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. 
The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, his love endures forever. Very good. Thank you. Think about it for a minute. What happened here? Two big things happened. God did something and the people did something. What did God do? Accepted the burnt offering. Accepted the burnt offering and what? Sent fire from heaven. Sent fire from heaven and what? Consume. Thank you. There, back in the back. Thank you. Yes. The glory of the Lord descended upon it and filled the temple. So much so that the priests couldn't even go in. The glory of the Lord resided there. Let's put that one up. One. The glory of the Lord <laughs> yeah I know I'm trying to think how to spell it resided there so the glory of the Lord is there it's in one spot it's in one place and it fills the temple what is the response of the glory of the Lord being in his temple yes Yes, so here we go. So here's your two functions of the temple. One, it's to, to be a centralized point of the glory of the Lord, where His people can worship Him. So it's to display His glory and to provide a place for worship. So those are the two main ones, worship. And I'm just going to write worship for time. I think you know what I'm talking about. So that's the first part. But that's not the only part. Go a little bit further in chapter 7, over to verse 11. You ready? When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord in the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him by, at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their, heal their land." Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Stop right there. What is the purpose? What is going to take place here? What are some of the things that are going to take place in the temple? One is prayers. Or prayer, and underneath that we can put forgiveness. That's what Tracy was saying, repentance, right? Yes, repentance, healing. What else is going to take place there? Sacrifice. Sacrifices. Sacrifices. There's actually going to be another thing that takes place here, but I'm going to hold off for that one. We're going to go. We're going to look at it a little bit more. Now, here, here's here's the problem, though. Go down to about verse 21. God's giving a warning. If my people do not turn, do not repent. Look into what he says, and starting in verse 21 of chapter 7. And though this temple is now so imposing, 
all who pass by will be appalled and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he has brought all this disaster on them. Part of that prophecy is the disaster of the temple. So, the temple, God was going to show his glory in the temple by whether or not the temple was going to be, was going to survive. It was an imposing force. The blessing was there. People would come, they would see, they would see the, the beauty, the glory that was there at the temple. They would worship. They would come by and go, yes, Israel, look, their God, that's the temple of their God. But if they failed to obey and walk right, failed to repent, walked away from God, then God would destroy the land and the temple. And when people walked by the temple and saw it destroyed, they would say, the glory of the Lord is gone. Not only must they must have done something wrong, but... This is what they have they have rebelled against their god. They have forsaken their god. They have worshiped other gods. It was a sign of God's uh, relationship with them. Temple stays, blessing. Temple temple destroyed. That's a sign to the world that God was a holy god, a jealous god, and that he was passing judgment. So the temple had in this glory of the Lord had not only a dual purpose for, for the people to give them reason for praise, but it also had a purpose for the world. The world could look at the light on the top of the hill, and if the light was out, then God was not there. They would know God's judgment had come. So, we got prayer. Prayer took place inside there. And if you go to Isaiah 56, you'll see that. If you go to, just really quickly over to Matthew, chapter 21. Yep, 1532 in your black books, black Bibles. This is one of the two cleansings of the temple. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. And in starting in verse 12 of chapter 21, it says, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. What, what was the purpose? What was to be done inside the temple? Prayer. It was called a house of prayer. Right? Okay. Uh, let's see. We see it again in John chapter 2. This is a different one this time. John chapter 2. It's on page 1648. Starting in verse 12 again. You there? John chapter 2, starting in verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others, others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now I got this quick question, quick question here. 
Why would Jesus get so mad? Disrespect for his father. Disrespect for his father? Okay. Well, they were sinning there because yeah. they were abusing, like, abusing their authority. He has to be holy. But people needed sacrifices. So obviously they had to be able to buy them. I mean, this is Passover. There's several million people passing through they Jerusalem. They were dishonest, though. Oh, so if they were honest marketeers, if they were honest selling animals. I don't think there was anything in the Old Testament about selling animals in the temple. Was there? Well, they did make a racket out of it because they had the money changers and you had to change your foreign currency into their currency. Then they would charge you ten times the price for a spotted, dirty... Dove, and they didn't care anything about God. He was trying to make money. So is it, they're right. That's right. They 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 were selling nasty, deformed, uh, sacrifice sacrificial animals. They were making they were they were cheating people on the money exchange. They were doing all sorts of things. But those all may be true. But let's say they weren't. Let's say they were doing it, and it was a purely perfect, honest way of getting animals and sacrifices to the people on Passover so that they could have something to sacrifice. That's not what they're supposed to be there. What? That's not what they're supposed to be doing there. That's not what they're supposed to be doing there. It wasn't what the temple was built for. It wasn't what God consecrated it for. He didn't consecrate it to be a business. He didn't consecrate it to be a barn. He didn't consecrate it to make money off of the things of the temple, the, the sacrifices and the, 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 the things that were going on inside. God said, this is what my house is for. And Jesus was mad. Now think about this. Passover, two million, three million, however many people are crammed trying to get through the temple to make their sacrifice. Everybody was supposed to be make, come and make a sacrifice. And the place is packed. Animals. Think about the noise. Think about the, the palace. The temple guards were there. The police. The temple police were there. The priests were there. All these people were there. And one man, one man takes some cords and whatever is in his eyes, the fiery anger that he is showing is enough to clear the entire temple court. The, I, one of, this is one of my things. It's, just, I don't, it's not in the Bible anywhere. It's just, this is what I think. I think this was a miracle. I think this was the holy, awesome, righteous, divine, sovereign God <coughs> whipping out and saying, I'm in my house. What are you doing here? And like those people before in, the, um, in, Sam, in Samuel or in Chronicles, that when the glory of the Lord came down, they whoa, put their face to the ground. They just outside. bowed it. That was outside. Here Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect replica of the glory and radiance of God, steps into the temple, his Father's house, and out of righteous anger is able to get all those people and all those animals out. I bet there were people running over themselves trying to get out of his path. This is just one guy, one man with a fiery zeal for his father's house. So the glory of God wasn't in the temple at that time? No, I don't believe it was because it talks about it in the Old Testament. The glory of the Lord, uh, the glory of the Lord just left. He just walked away. Okay. If I remember right. But they kept on going. What else took place? Well, the tithes were brought there. <coughs> you know, those tithes were brought to the temple. For what? What were tithes brought to the temple for? Anybody. They were supposed to be. 
Yeah, what well, the tithes. You brought tithes. You brought money. You brought to, to for what? Welfare for the priests. For, for it the was tribe. it was to it was to it was to pay the priests, give them something to live off of. It was the nation's welfare system because there was no welfare system. So the church, the 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 priests were the ones that took care of the people, and so you brought. Mind you, there were more than one tithe. There were three. So you brought a tenth of something, and here was the first one. That was your priestly tithe. And then you brought your other something, another tenth or so, and that was your basically your taxes that you paid because there was no tax in the country. Israel had no tax system, no central government. It was the church. It was the, it was, it was the, 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 the priest. Later it was the Romans, but that was different. So you had all these things that were going on in the temple, so that was there. And you had, of course, the, the sacrifices. So, and then service. People were being helped in, out of the temple, too. So all those things took place.